When you hear the word hacker, you envision someone breaking into a computer. But did you know that people can be hacked? The manipulation and persuasion of people can lead to someone gaining physical access to a location or even data being leaked. Today's guest is Jenny Radcliffe. Jenny is the founder and director of Human Factor Security and is commonly known as the People Hacker. She's a world-renowned social engineer hired to bypass security systems through a no-tech mixture of psychology, con artistry, cunning, and guile. Jenny is also a podcaster, keynote speaker, talk show host, and panel chair. I'm your host, Chris Parker, and this is the Easy Prey Podcast. Jenny, thank you so much for coming on the Easy Prey Podcast today. Thank you for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you. So can you give me a little bit of background as to how you became known as the People Hacker? Oh, sure. So um, actually, I was being interviewed by a journalist a few years ago, and I was explaining what I did. So I'm a social engineer. And what that means is it's no tech hacking. So whereas a normal hacker, uh, you might see in sort of popular culture or the movies, usually a male in a hoodie behind a computer, right? So I'm not that. I'm people hacker. So what I do is I use psychology, persuasion, influence, uh, manipulation techniques um, to get past people, to break security um, in order to fix that and, and, and to amend it in case, you know, the real bad guys do those things. It's an education piece, um, but I don't really use technology. So I do two things, physical infiltration, which is also known as breaking and entering or burglary, um, but ethically. So I'm hired to do it by the person I'm robbing uh, and psychology. And so people hacker fits quite well because I work with the people rather than the tech. So I have a question about the the, the physical breaking and entering. Yes. I, I recently heard a story of uh, someone who was hired as a physical pen tester, and uh, they went into the wrong branch of the bank. Right. Has that ever happened to you? I've never broken into the wrong... <laughs> <laughs> the wrong branch of the bank or the wrong building. Although we've done, I mean, there's been lots of mistakes, you know. I mean, I've done, I've, I've left items, identifying items behind in, in very sort of serious situations. Um, one time in Asia, I left, I left a, a, a little torch behind the children's hotel I was staying in, and when we realised that it's a gangster's house, I was being asked to break into. That probably was a bad thing to do. Um, and we've certainly made lots of mistakes. I mean, I've locked myself in rooms and had to climb out of windows. And I was four floors up in the middle of Europe to do that one. But I don't think I've ever broken into the, <laughs> the wrong building entirely. I think that would be a that would be a, a new level of error for me. Yeah. Yeah, that was that. I, I heard that story. I was like, oh, that is utterly scary to uh, because I could see that. Not you didn't see it happening. I, or not necessarily the wrong address, but if you think you're dealing with uh, a representative for the agency and it turns out that they're not actually a representative for that entity. I see. I, 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 I had jobs in the past where I didn't ask enough questions as to who the client was. So I kind of assumed that the client, because I kind of knew them a bit, assumed that they were legitimate and they were working on behalf of whoever's property I was getting into. And and in hindsight, I probably should have asked a few more questions. Maybe I wouldn't have ended up lying on the ground with armed guards looking for me. But, you know, you roll with the punches, Chris. Well, okay, okay. Now, you have to tell that story. How did you end <laughs> up? <laughs> I told it so many times. Basically, just I, I was asked to bring it, just to give you the, 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 the umbrella of it, but I was asked to go and um, to check someone's address book in the desk to see if there was a name in it. And if that name was in it, I had to leave a message. I had to leave a post-it note. Um, but when I got there, it was a complete, it was a private residence. It was a completely empty house. And the person who gave me the job gave me lots of jobs. Uh, and what, you know, we're, we're a legitimate uh, broker, if you like, security sort of broker who gave lots of contracts out. But this particular woman, I was never really sure whether it was, whether he knew the individual and it was a joke and that the individual had said, you know, my house is pretty secure or something like that. But there was something very off about the whole thing. And everything went well. 
until I was trying, I, I sort of was ready to leave and the, and the private security firm turned up. So his own guards of whoever owned the premises sort of pulled up in these huge four by fours outside and I ran out, but I couldn't run past the vehicles because they were blocking the exit, the gate of the drive. So I just pushed myself up against the wall and lay down flat. But I had very long hair and it got caught probably under the wheel of one of the cars and I just remember thinking at the time, this is so off. This I don't have to get out of jail free or anything. In fact, if I'm caught, I'm probably on my own. And it turned out I, I was, you know, verified later. He said, yeah, of course you were on your own. It was a it was a higher level job than usual. But I mean, they're not usually like that. And people will have heard me say that before. So I need to say different ones. But yes, if, sometimes you don't check, I think. Or at least I didn't in, back in the day when I was younger. Oh, that is, that is, that is amazing. So so let's talk about the, the, the social engineering, the, the, the no tech hack, the hopefully mm-hmm. where you're not having to physically break and enter. How did you get involved in doing like that aspect of it? What has, what excited you about that learning that? Oh, uh, well, it's always but can I just say, like I do say the psychology and physical, it's always better to talk your way in than to break in. Okay. So, you know, it's not plan A. But I uh I, I, I learned it when I was younger. I have family who were security and who were kind of up to urban exploration uh, stuff in and around where I lived. And they taught me some of the tricks of kind of getting around alarm systems and things like that and, and, and lock picking. And I suppose gradually, you know, that was all empty buildings and things when we started. And then, you know, kids do say, so usually you stop there, right? We'll get into the empty building in the neighbourhood. But but we started to get into places that weren't so empty. And just to give it, you know, variety, in case anyone's able me speak on other podcasts about it, but like things like we had a museum in Liverpool and it's got about four or five floors or something. I can't remember exactly. But we thought it'd be great to sleep over in the museum. Like, so to get in, to hide... Mm. Um, and spend the night in the museum and you know I saw like Night at the Museum the movie like 20 years later longer 30 years later and sort of laugh my head off at the idea that you know everything came to life because when we did that we got in and um, there's no people always think that there's alarms and things and nobody switches them on if this is a security guard the security guard tends to be the, you know walking around they don't really put anything on there were no alarms or anything there was nothing was locked we went in late afternoon we hid out all on our own so toilets and and, and places nobody was caught they locked the place up the guy sat at his desk started reading a newspaper and we just started running around <laughs> this museum which is still in Liverpool my hometown in the northwest of England and still has most of the same ex- exhibits that it had then but it's spooky as anything because there was like an Egyptian mummy section which is just <laughs> at night when you're a kid on the light it was just terrifying you know it was and there were insects and, and aquariums and things and I remember thinking that wasn't quite as scary as the mummies and things but we ended up going to the top which was a planetarium and um space sort of astronaut suits and bits off rockets and things um, that America had sent to the moon. So they just, for some reason, Liverpool's got some sort of NASA memorabilia. I remember we, in the end, we, we'd sort of all congregated in the space part of the museum and spent the night up there, occasionally sort of running away from the security guard that made maybe two patrols throughout the whole night, just because it was less frightening to be there than by the mummies and the... <laughs> Roman coins and everything, you know, and so like that was really. But it was, it didn't frighten me so much as it was exciting, and it was sort of the words I choose is it's other. You have a, a different thing than other people, and it's sort of this secret clandestine world and hobby that that I that I was very drawn to, and I was always drawn to sort of the night and the night, kind of like the night of a city and the way cities moved at night and buildings moved at night. And I guess that was really very intriguing for me. So I absorbed as much as I could about about doing that. And then, you know, lo and behold, years later, it's an industry <laughs> and it's legit these days. But yeah, I guess that's how, how it started. That's that's amazing. Do you like the, the aside from the social, non-physical being plan A, do you, do you like that more or do you like the 
the physical entry more? Well, I mean, the trouble is I'm older now and I'm fatter. Do you know what I mean? Like when I was younger, I was a bit slim and I was sort of quite quite fit. And I could, it's a very physical job. Like it's a very demanding job physically. You don't really, if you're doing it properly, you don't really spend a lot of time being still. And if you do, it's inside like a toilet cubicle or a cupboard or something, you know. I mean, I think of the times I've been in a cupboard sort of crouched and it's your knees and your thighs and your hamstrings start to go and you sort of your calf muscles hurt because you're in these like strange positions. Um, but but it, it's it's fun and it's funny and I've enjoyed doing it. I think I couldn't say I liked one more than the other, but I mean, that's definitely more of a, there's a stop. With, with with the physical excuse me with the physical stuff there's a start a middle and an end, and when you finish a physical engagement, and you leave a building, you know, and you've hopefully like you know you've done the job and you've you know you've managed to capture whatever it was that you were in there to take, or, or you've you know you've taken the photographs or you've downloaded the stuff. What we do is we celebrate. We do. It. I always have always done it because I was kind of my first couple of times I did it. The person I was with did it. Is that we have a song selected, so we pick a song, and it used to be on tapes or CDs, and now I can just pick anything off Spotify. So we used to have to pre-plan what song would work with a successful heist, but now obviously we can pick anything. And and what you'll find, what I find I'm very very calm until about 10 minutes afterwards and then all the adrenaline kind of leaves you feel like you're going to throw up your legs go kind of wobbly and stuff and we play a song and kind of headbang in the car and usually have something very sugary to eat just to reset everything um chemically in the body and obviously if it's late we'll have a drink as well <laughs> so you know it's kind of like there's a celebration to that whereas with with the psychological stuff sometimes with uh when I'm waiting for someone to take the bait or to click on a fishing link or or to, or to tell, particularly if it's a colleague and I'm listening in and we're waiting for them to give the last piece of information. Um, that can be quite quite fun as well. But I think the physical stuff is, it's more theatrical and I suppose more dramatic. Yeah. I'm very theatrical about it and, and it's more, the, I'm old-fashioned about it and it's more sort of, of a celebration, I'd say. And yeah, it makes sense that there's a beginning, a middle and an end for the, the, the physical stuff. Once you... Yeah. You know, you're waiting for someone to click on a phishing link. It's not like you're sitting at your computer for 18 hours. Well, hopefully you're not. Uh, you can see them sometimes. You, know, you just, you, you, like, we're waiting for, you can see them open it. And then it's sort of like, I've got to think there's a picture on my Instagram, which is at real people hacker, if anyone cares. And, um, and I'm kind of just sitting waiting. And I wrote on it, so we're waiting for them to take the bait because we can see it's being opened. And my tech colleagues would be so like, they've opened it, but now we're waiting for them to click. And I'm kind of like, uh, go on, go on, go on again. That's ah. <laughs> you know, because that's our payday then. You know, so yeah. So, so for the audience, I, I, I think you know, physical entry. There's, you know, there's all sorts of intrigue, and we see lots of. We've seen every James Bond movie where it's all about the mm-hmm. and uh, all about the physical entry and all the Mission Impossible where they're climbing upside. There's a lot buildings. more explosions in the movies. <laughs> a lot more explosions. <laughs> <laughs> Lots more destruction. We don't want destruction. That comes off the food. So no. I, I think your goal was to ne- there never to be any evidence that you were ever there. Ideally, you don't you don't really want them to know you've done it. You want them to, to be astounded. I leave little octopuses and business cards and things everywhere. I have little silver octopuses I leave. You want them to be astounded that you got in, you know, because because that does a good job of convincing them what they need to do their security so that's so yeah ideally we wouldn't they wouldn't know we've been in i mean i guess if you're 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 leaving uh, trinkets behind it's almost mm-hmm. the i wonder if people are more uh like astounded like let's you know we'll make up a tv show you know plot where there's you know they open up the safe in the morning and the and the little octopus is in the safe and they're like oh my gosh how did you know how did they yeah. get in and, and and how did jenny get in and do this that's a little more theatrical than oh yeah, someone logged into my computer and you know exactly. downloaded my files. It's <laughs> exactly right. And you know what I found certainly in the last few years is people are definitely hiring physical pen testers, or, or certainly hiring my, me and my team. Uh, 
because we're a little bit more unusual, I think, then we do things slightly. Just because I'm not technical, I'm not a particularly technical person, so we do have to do things slightly uh, in, in, a, in a more kind of, I don't know whether it's a sort of in a more binary way, like you were there or you weren't, you know, physically in the place. And I did, I took, you know, early days, I just take a few photographs of myself sitting in the CEO's chair and stuff, and I just thought it was just a bit egocentric. So I thought instead of being me, there'll be just evidence that we've been there. It used to always be business cards. And I've got thousands and thousands of photographs um, sort of all on like a, a drive that's kind of locked away and hidden of, of just where those those cards are. Yeah, I don't even remember where some, you know, some of them are because it'll be a picture of a desk or a pipe or a roof or something or a coffee pot with a business card in. And, you know, and, and that goes in the report. And, and I number them sometimes. I might have 25 business cards with numbers on. And a number say, like, you know, you find this, call the number. And I know I still, the odd time, get someone ring and say, you know, I've been told to call this. I'm like, God, that, that was from a pen test from, like, 2007. <laughs> you know, and you found number 21. So, so Hello, I found a business card to number 21. I'm supposed to ring this number. Like, what? Oh, you know, that, really? that, that's got to be interesting. Like, and then and that person was probably not even there when the pen test happened. <laughs> and I only even remember which business it was or which test it was because we, we will put a code on it. And I only started doing that latterly because of exactly that problem. <laughs> People are drinking, go, yeah, I found number 16. And I've been told to ring and say I found number 16. And I'd be like, this sounds really amateurish for me to go, what company was that again? Because there might be quite a lot of this. <laughs> <laughs> There's quite a lot of my business cards lying in offices all over Britain and say and the world, but more, you know, particularly in the UK, you could you could literally be anyone. So <laughs> I'm going to start looking for business cards when I when I travel and just see if I can I find now. random things laying behind. Or maybe yeah, I should. I have deniability now. I have deniability because <laughs> I've said it on your show and others. Like I suppose I've said it in public more than once that anyone could just be framing me. So that that, be me. that's a, that's a good answer. I know. <laughs> but, but I guess I mean I guess there is a certain amount of even the physical entry. There is a certain amount of social engineering involved in that as well. I mean I think of um, one company I worked for. We were we were renting an office, and the uh, the property management sent out a letter to all the all the the tenants, basically saying, uh, "Watch out for people coming into your office, you know, carrying clipboards or briefcases." Mm-hmm. They would walk into the office, head towards a conference room, like not even talk to anybody, just with that air of authority of, I'm supposed to go to that conference room. Mm-hmm. And as they would walk by some woman's desk, they would just grab a purse and then walk out the other exit door. And no mm-hmm. one would even no one would even think to to stop them and ask them who they are, what they're doing, because they had that air of authority of authorities are intentionality. Good one. Yeah, it's one of Shaldini's top sort of six influence and strategies is authority and the high vis vest and the clipboard. Yeah, it's a cliche, but it works. But God, it's working now with the COVID thing. I mean, I did a pen test a couple of weeks ago. <laughs> but COVID inspector, wait there. And they all just waited. <laughs> it's like, you know, and okay. I, I would genuinely wouldn't, you know, would advise anyone here who's in charge of security or has got anything to do with security who's listening to this. You know, we're recording it just as as a lot of countries in the West certainly are starting to hopefully tentatively go back to something like an on-prem working model. <laughs> just know that your people do not know which way is up. And, yeah. and if someone says COVID, wait, they will wait. COVID, write down your email. I had as a pad, write down your email on the pad for the COVID check. And I just thought I'll try it and your password underneath. <laughs> now, do it now. Thank you. Thank you. It's a pain, isn't it? I know it's a pain. I have to do it as well. Thanks very much for your password. Stop. <laughs> but it's because nobody knows what the rules are anymore. You see. I mean, I mean that, and that, and that even that even makes more sense. Uh, my wife's company for her department during COVID, while everybody is remote, they hired multiple people. So they now are starting to do the hybrid coming back into the office. And there are people who've worked for the company for a year who have never set foot in the office. They don't know what the procedures are. If someone came up to them and told them, do this, do that. I don't know if you're the you're the help desk guy. Yeah. Social engineers basically capitalize on, on fear, uncertainty, and doubt. And what we've got, we have fear and doubt 
ramped up in 2020. Now we're starting to go back. It's uncertainty because nobody really knows what's going on. And I mean, I went, you know, that when I was in London doing the pen test and then I, I did a few other sort of uh, events and things, you know, everywhere, like this is London at like mid morning, empty tube stations, you know, the subway, empty subway stations. And I mean, it felt like a movie, some sort of post apocalyptic drama that we're all living in and all of that stuff just adds to that otherworldliness that that, the criminals will capitalize on yeah Yeah, that that, and that's you know that's the whole reason why i do the do the podcast is because criminals are always exploiting this stuff Mm -hmm. and especially when you have so much fear and uncertainty like what am i supposed to do i don't know Mm -hmm. if i do the wrong thing i'm gonna get fired i'm gonna get sick i'm gonna get my family sick exactly and that's why we always say when we're uh, talking to people and doing tests it's it's no one can be fired as a result of 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 of, our, of what we do because we will con them we're professional con artists we will con you um someone in that company is going to fall for something so we want to make sure that they don't they don't fire away. but a no blame culture is very important because if if you if staff feel and, and no one's going to say it outright that they're going to blame people for, for for falling for it but it's it's what's done sort of uh clandestinely you know you know underneath the, what the company's corporate policy is is there really a blame culture going on because if there is people just won't report when they think that they've been fooled or when they think something's in progress and and criminals will 100 percent you know sins like the dark right crime likes the dark they like it likes to be hidden truth likes the light so what you've got to do is bring it all into the light make sure that people know that this is you know it's like you tell kids you know you know i i, I say um i've been on a few shows in the uk about uh children and protecting kids online and i say you know one piece of advice is if someone tells you to keep something secret, it's code. Tell your kids it's code to come and tell me straight away. That's a code. It's a, it's a password. Tell me straight away. And that's almost the same thing we need to do with staff. We need to say if, if something feels wrong, you feel like you've done something wrong and, and that someone's kind of coerced you or, or, or fooled you, that's code to come and tell the security team straight away. And then the security team genuinely has to be sympathetic. You know? that, that, that was one of my triggers for um, in, in telling people, like, if you're – uh, you think even if you don't think you're being scammed by someone, as soon as they tell you like not to talk to somebody, mm. or they start coaching you on what to say, yeah, like that's the huge, you know. And the quicker you can do it, the better. It's like with romance scams. The minute that you get that like nagging doubt, get it out there right away, because it's like a bully. It's like you give the bully your lunch money and they said, just give me your lunch money today and I promise you I'll leave you alone. And then Tuesday comes and they want it again. And by the time, you know, they've got your lunch money and your bus fare and everything else, you just have to kill it as soon as it, as soon as you identify it, it just has to be out in the open and it'll end. You know, it'll, it, the, what you, you'll get is the beginning of the end of whatever it is, however bad that is. Yeah, that, that was always my fear with like blackmail or ransomware. Um, mm. I've, I've gotten a few... Uh, Hey, we're gonna launch a a, a, a seven day, five hundred megabit denial of service attack on your website if yes. you don't send us, you know, two Bitcoin or whatever it was. <laughs> and and the first thing that go always goes through my mind is, okay, you're you're dishonorable enough to scam me, you know, to, to steal from me, but you're honorable enough not to steal from me twice. <laughs> Yeah, it depends though on, on like with ransomware and with that whole model. It's a bad business. Like you, you really, in some ways, you almost want to be dealing with an organized gang because they have a proper business model, which means they will do their best to honor what they say yeah. in as much as from a reputation point of view, they won't make any money at all. They can only do it for so long. If they never, if they, if you never get anything back and everything's destroyed, they scam you again. Then no one, there's just no arguments, is it? You just, you don't pay you because you know, you're going to not get your data back. It's always kind of like a, it's a bit of a false argument. I sometimes think to say, there's no guarantee you get it back. Well, I know that, but you know, there are ways that we can, negotiate for proof of life and we can negotiate for you know that we can decrypt and we can get certain things back um so but like they're not the only people who do i'm not saying they're good people or it's better i'm just saying that like they have a business model which kind of feeds into a victim pays and so you get it back because then 
you know, that's, they got a reputation for getting That's the involved. best thing. That's the best thing for their for the for their legit. Well, okay, for their illegitimate business. Yeah, the because best otherwise thing is the, it's just you don't get it back anyway. So, like the insurance company wouldn't tell them to pay or whatever. But they're not the only people who do it. That are you know, sort of uh, what, what would you call them? Lone cowboys or whatever who do it and and. And sometimes I don't think they know what they're doing and, and you don't get it back, you know. And that's why we always say never pay. Yeah. Um, but the trouble is, is I, I kind of like, we, we, you know, we're coming on the back of an awful lot of very high profile ransomware attacks. You've got Colonial Pipeline was very recent. Yeah. The Irish Health Service. Uh, AXA over in Asia was just hacked. We had, you know, Moss Bros. We had Toyota. I mean, there's all these companies this last couple of weeks being hacked. And the problem with it is, is of course you shouldn't pay. You don't know. You, we could be funding terrorism. It probably is. But you're asking people with a gun to the head to see the bigger picture. What you're saying to people in that in that moment is you've either 100%, there's either a 100% chance that you'll get nothing back and whatever they're threatening you with, you know, with all the data leaks and GDPR fines over here and all of that, that's definitely going to happen if you don't pay. Or your insurance company might well give you some part of, of what they're asking for, and you might get back most of what you potentially have lost. And that's, you know, you're looking at a business ending event for a lot of businesses. Yeah. And that's why it's not as straightforward as say it's all very well for us in the industry to say you shouldn't pay. Well, of course you shouldn't pay. You shouldn't pay someone. If I mean, we had a case of somebody whose pet was stolen. This is a quite a while ago, and I'm not laughing because it's not funny. But they got just to say the pet was fine. But it was a high net worth individual whose pet was stolen. They were going to hit. They were going to kill the pet. And of course you shouldn't pay because then they'll go and and they went on and did it again. And it's mm-hmm. terrible. And yeah, there's, I'm sure there was um, pets that died. But you can't... It, we have to try and remove the emotion from the victim and see if we can negotiate yeah. it for them. Because at that point, they'll pay anything because they don't want to see you know, a video of their dog being shot, basically. Oh. I mean, yeah. and and that's I mean, and that I think that's one of the challenges behind that. If you have a small business and they're being, you know, it's ransomware. Okay, the business owners in the position of I pay a set amount of money, which either I can or I can't afford. You know, let's let's assume they can't afford it somehow, and they will be able to afford it because what the ransomware gangs will do is that when they take when they get onto their network, they'll look at things like the insurance policy, they'll look at the finances, and they will look and say, "What does a day of downtime cost? What's the insurance policy covering?" They'll make sure that it's affordable, but high. I mean, I would if I was them. I mm-hmm. could think like a criminal. And, and the business person's put in the position of, okay, I can afford to do this, but if I don't do this, then all the people that work for me, you know, I can't yeah. pay. I can't pay them. I can't. They can't support their families, or you know, especially if it's going to put them out of business. Type of event, right? It's, so it's, it's definitely not simply. Gone. It's not. A, it's not. There's so much emotion behind the decision. It's not simple, and 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 therefore it's it's it's, and you've got to think who's in that room. You've probably got the lawyer in the room. You've got the insurance company in the room. Depending on the size and impact, maybe law enforcement in the room. You know, there'll be a business case to pay it. Sometimes that's why it's carrying on. If it was just as yeah. simple as just never pay, it, they wouldn't do it. We just need to get to a point where enough businesses prevent enough of it for it to be not profitable anymore but i can't see that happening anytime soon unfortunately because it's despicable you know to to, to attack a health service is obviously despicable yeah so 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 what is happening that um these large i mean like i I don't want to excuse mom and pop organizations for not having best practices in place yeah but what's happening with these entities colonial pipeline they should know how to they should have one they're they're big enough that they should have people on staff to be able to potentially address these types of situations what's happening that they're not but you know you could say the same thing about fishing you could say well you know 75 percent of organizations worldwide and i think i'm quoting verus on stats of 2020 um have, have said that they've had some sort of fishing attack 27 percent of them i think were spearfished why are they getting through well because like the reason it's the most popular pastime for hackers is because it works why does it work well because you only need to get through once and so with social engineering we only need one person to do it once i only need one person mm-hmm. 
to let me through a door and I'm in, it's breached. And it's the same, you know, with tech, you need the technology and technical digital solutions to do the heavy lifting in terms of defense, you know, so have everything in place, have the, you know, your, your antivirus, have all, you know, all of that in place. But the, the, you know, the minute that some employee is working from home, is very tired, an email comes through, and there's a network problem, and, and you know, and BYOD, shadow IT, on they go, once, and they're in, and 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 that's it. And that you know, how long does it take to detect? Look at solar winds. Yeah. yeah. Now, admittedly, that was quite a busy high. You know, emotion time for everybody that last sort of six months or so of 2020. You know, for all sorts of reasons we needn't go into here. Things were a bit mad, but they were, they know that they were on those networks for months and months and months. And how did they get on there? Probably email. Malware's delivered via email. Yeah. Is, so, what, so what you're saying is it's not necessarily that it's an issue of well, as long as you have good network security, as long as you have real time off. Offline backups, you know. You might be able to slow it down. You might be able to detect it quickly, slow it down if it gets there. Um, you might be less likely to be hit. You might be able to filter a lot of things. At the end of the day, these things are such a problem, and our industry, the cybersecurity industry, is so huge. Is because despite our best efforts, things mistakes happen. You know, if you talk about. Uh, 95% roundabout, you know, the, the stuff that everyone's quoting of breaches are down to human error or manipulation. So as long as there's a human somewhere that's exploitable, that's what social engineers do, and it's what hackers do, it's what criminals do, you know. So we we will try and we block more than get through, but sometimes something will get through. Um, so, so do you see the point where there is enough training to prevent – Spear phishing that pre- that prevents the social engineering. Is there even enough training that could ever happen? It will always be human, and and you can, you've, people forget and they get tired, and sometimes something will get through that just it resonates. You know, it could be the most obvious four one nine scam, but it really resonates with that person. Just something's happened that day where it rings true. Mm-hmm. So you'll always get something that gets through, but the role of training and awareness is is always huge because the more suspicious people are, and and I hate saying it because people don't want to be suspicious, they don't want to be paranoid. We're in security, so we we are anyway. You just can't cure it. We've all got tinfoil hats and God knows what else in the, in the background. And you know, as soon as like the pandemic hit, we all had our plans, our survival plans, or at least friends that did. But your normal person. You just have to keep repeating it because it's not their biggest problem or priority. So you just have to keep repeating it. And we hope, I guess we just hope that on the day that that mail hits them, they remember. But you can't, you can't bulletproof everything and you you can't guarantee it. Otherwise I wouldn't have a job. I mean, tell you like, talk about stories. There's a story where (laughs) the guy had said to me, you'll never get in, right? He says, our factory is, he said, we've spent 2 million quid on a perimeter. He said, there's fences, there's locks, there's cameras, there's infrared, and there's guards. The only way you'll get onto our site is if someone leaves the door open for you, right? And I got a piece of paper and I wrote on it, please do not, underscored not, close this door and signed it like HR and just pinned it, taped it up to the door and just sat and waited. And someone kind of went, oh, sort of locked it. I went like that, got a bit of... um, (laughs) Like a bit of card off a like a like a, a an Amazon box and just wedge the door open. And then I was just stood there sort of going, you see, this is fish in a barrel. And then everyone's going backwards and forwards through the door. No one's closing it. Well, why? Because it's got written on it, please do not close the store. And we just walked in and and just did the job and like rinsed them completely. If we'd have been criminals, they'd have been absolutely you know, compromised, devastated, personal data of the works. <laughs> but, they, but you know, and I just said, that seems very easy. It's not, it's simple, but it's not easy. I have to know the way that business works. I have to know that they obeyed rules, that it was hierarchical, right? I have to, I, you have to observe to know those things and to know that that would work because that's, that takes a lot of cheek to try that one. Um, but like, it worked like a charm, eh? So, Yes, it's, it's, it's you have to know. 
I, I'm just laughing as you as you're telling me. Well, I I need to understand the the you know the corporate mindset. I'm thinking of. Well, that wouldn't work in the company where everybody hates HR and does everything they can to spite HR. HR puts a sign on the door and they're like, ha, I'm going to close it just to make HR mad. <laughs> yeah, reactivism. So like, you know, so in that case, it'd be like uh, you, you'd work with that the opposite way. <laughs> this door must always be closed. <laughs> well, I've got a face again on on Instagram. I've got a face graph and, <laughs> and I couldn't resist. And it said this window cannot be opened and it's just open. <laughs> That was just a place I was staying, and I just said, "Yes, it can." You know, and people will do it just to just to just to sort of stick it to the man type of thing. Um, and so you, so if you identify that in a culture, that that's very, uh, that's very powerful actually. But it's less reliable than than compliance. Yeah, I think that, that, that's what inter- people think. That's really kind of interesting. That in a really compliant minded organization. That something seemingly as simple as don't close this door, okay, yeah. but that I shouldn't close it. <laughs> no. no, and also because, that, like, even if they're suspicious of it, I did a talk called The Seven People You Meet in a Pen Test, right? <laughs> and one of the people that yours meet in a pen test, and anyone who does physicals or pen tests will tell you, you you'll meet someone who, know, who, who, who absolutely makes you, they know that you shouldn't be there. They sort of look and think that's suspicious. And you see them do it, and then they decide for whatever reason not to pursue it. So they look at you and they cut her hand and go, I'm on to you. Okay. And then don't do anything about it. And there was one job in particular where we oh, there was me and a, an accomplice and we and we were definitely caught. Definitely. We were sitting drinking coffee, but like I'm pretending to wear, but like uh, in quite a quiet part. And this guy went past. And I always remember. I'm not going to say how, but he had, a, he had a big identifier. Let's say it was a great big beard, but it wasn't. But let's say it was that. So you couldn't miss him. Absolutely couldn't miss him. And he went past and he gave a look and gave a look. And, and fatal error, I made eye contact. And then my accomplice made eye contact and just held for too long. And he kept on going like, said, he knows, that guy knows. So we got up and we went out. And we started, we walked to the smoking shelter outside the, um, the, the place we were in just to kill time just to not be on the inside and here's this guy so now he's come out and instead and he didn't come out for the smoking shelter he just did a circuit of the build of the building looked at us again did another circuit of the building and I said to him to the guy who was with I said we had, that'll be it they'll tan on it or the security will be looking for us at any moment but now but now but now finished the whole thing left and only later kind of went, but where was Beard Guy? Like, what did he do? So nothing. Okay. So then we go and present the findings. And then part of the, the, the follow-up to that was they asked me to do like an all-hands keynote um, <laughs> using footage from the bloody break-in. Excuse me. <laughs> so this is us walking through reception. This is us in your toilet. You know, this is us in the... This is my friend climbing on the roof for absolutely no reason, just because he likes roofs type of thing. And I and I could see the beard guy in the audience, and I said, you know, I said not to him directly, but I said to the client, see that guy with the beard? I'm sure he saw us. And he said, oh, oh he did. He's told us later he did. I said, why? <laughs> why did he do anything? And he said he just had no answer as to why he didn't do anything. He thought it was some sort of like test. <laughs> well, it was a test, <laughs> and it was a test, and you failed it. You know pal but like how strange is that and like I, I but I see that all this all the time people who either say that they knew you were fake or actually clearly did and genuinely did make you know you were busted and just shoot because it's not their problem it's not their business it's adding a dimension of hassle to a day that they don't need you know they don't need to know this they don't need to get involved it's just not, especially in Britain I just do not want to get involved you know English people British people tend to be like if it, I, I'm not seeing you I'm not seeing, they're either completely nosy like everyone is you know look you know slowing down for the car accident they call it rubbernecking over here I don't know if it's called that in the States you know but slowing down to look at the car crash or just completely you know nothing to see I'm just blind to everything that isn't to do with my job my coffee my lunch just you know and someone literally could spontaneously combust in the corner of the you know, the dining area and they're just not going to say anything. They're just going to carry on drinking tea and getting on with the day because it's like quarter five on a Friday and 
nobody wants the hassle of that, you know. So you can rely on that as well. It, it, it totally okay. I'm I'm gonna date myself and <laughs> okay. You're you're in England, so hopefully. Well, actually, wasn't. Uh, did you ever read Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy or of any course. of that series? Of course, Douglas Adams is amazing. Yeah. Amazing, yeah. and there was a uh, uh, an invisibility on a ship, and when the ship would land, nobody would see it. But it wasn't really that nobody would see it. Everybody would see it, but it was somebody else's problem. So I have a I have a slide in my keynote that says this is because this is some of, this is not my problem. And you know the other thing from Douglas Adams, this is you probably end up editing this, but if you don't, people will probably love it. But the other thing for diehard Douglas Adams fans is the bit where they say, um, they're going to wipe out Earth and they say, now, stop complaining. You've been told you were issued with a notice and the notice is in the basement <laughs> behind a load of cupboards with like a Jaguar or something guarding it. That's what security used to be like. And some security teams still hide away in like a little tiny cupboard kind of at the end of a corridor with all the curtains and doors closed. Like you can't even find them. That's what it used to be like. You know, we, we, one of the problems in the industry was we kind of liked that. You know, the invisibility of the whole function, the complexity of the function. Uh, and now we're being brought into the light a bit more and, and asked to comment on things. So, you know, some 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 people in the industry love it and are on shows like this. Love me. I mean, I'm on millions of shows all the time. I never tire of talking about social engineering because I always think it, we always need to remind people and talk to people about it. But I've got friends and colleagues who just just embarrassed and, and, and mortified at the thought of having to talk about what they do. They want to keep it in the bait. Oh, for goodness sake, do I have to say what I do? Yeah, unfortunately, cyber is a, a, a business um, differentiator now. Oh, your cyber security is a differentiator. It is business against business. You know, that is something that, that defines how good a business is. And that does mean that a lot of us have to come out of the out of the basement and start really saying what we think, which which people seem to be just one or the other. They either can't shut up or they don't want to talk. I mean, we have to take off the hoodie, get out from uh, the dark the dark corner. And yeah. Now, who wants turn, to do turn that, on the, right? Turn on the lights. Nobody. <laughs> Nobody wants to do that. God. Oh my goodness. You are a great storyteller. And uh <laughs> I, I, I appreciate I, I appreciate you telling the stories because it, it I think it helps to lighten the topic. It it could be a very yeah. tense topic. It can be. It's it's especially when the you know, the ones you tend to remember are the things that go wrong, you know. And they're the ones that that certainly the industry want me to tell. Nobody wants to hear oh, well, we prepared really well. We went into an office, we, you know, we got everything we needed and we left without incident. That's not the best story in the world. It's, it's still great, but it's not the best story. So everybody wants to know the stories where something unusual happened or something went wrong. So I've been asked over the years, things like, you know, what's the strangest thing that ever happens on, on a physical pen test? And I try and give different answers every time. Unfortunately, there's a bank of, like things go wrong a lot. Oh, the unexpected happens a lot. And the one, one that I tell all the time is I was in a, I did a, a, a sort of a thing where I was there, I was late at night and I'd made up my mind not to leave until the morning. I was going to stay sort of just, just bunk down really and, and just stay there. I am in a building, a huge place on my own, only me and a couple of security guards who weren't even in the building. They were on the site. It was a huge facility and they were like right the other side. One of whom knew where, knew I was on site just for um, safety reasons the other one didn't so if the other one had seen me that would have been uh, interesting and it would have been get out of jail free and I think I don't know if I've told this exact one but I thought right I'll just uh, there was a room that was quite comfortable there was a sofa and it was dark and there was no way anyone was coming anywhere near me and I thought right I'm just gonna I'm gonna sit here for the night I'm a little backpack I had a drink I've been to the bathroom a few snacks I'll just kind of like quite in, in a way peaceful Right, the job's done. I'll wait for everything to sort of die down. Security guards do the change of shift about six a.m. So I'll set the <laughs> I'll set the alarm on my phone for kind of like half five, and I'll just kind of settle down here. It must have been about one o'clock in the morning by then, and I'll just chill. And um, great Wi-Fi, which I'm on. So I thought, right, I'll just watch a bit of Netflix. <laughs> <laughs> and as I'm watching a horror film about human organ harvesting of all things on Netflix and then got like got incredibly
slightly spooked by the fact that I'm on my own in this building. Do I ring someone and you know, oh god, can I hear something? Just ridiculous, really. You know, and that's after that's probably I've probably broken into five or six hundred different buildings in my time. And I still managed to freak myself out when everything was fine. It was fine. Why didn't I just read a, you know, I don't know, a, a, a nice calm book or watch Grace and Frankie or something that's very like, you know, chill and funny and just not worry about it. Why did I do that for? You know, and those are the type of things I'm always asked. Stories like, what you know, well, what was the funniest thing or what was the most unusual thing? Well, it's things like that. And it's nearly always inevitably my own fault. <laughs> I know what I should be doing. I know exactly what the rules are. I, I set them out. I train people. People know exactly. But you just, I was bored, wasn't I? You know, I hours to waste. The job's done. Nobody's there. So I know I'll just watch this horrible film and then frighten myself <laughs> after death. <laughs> okay, okay, okay. So so you, you, you commonly get asked what was the craziest thing? What's mm. the most boring, uneventful thing? The quickest, like, physical pen oh, chest? I could tell you. I know exactly this one. So we got this job. I got the job in 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 for me personally, but we there was a team. I thought we need a few of us just looking at it. And it was um, a mall, right? It's a big shopping set. We call it a shopping center. Great big shopping center in London, a mall. Huge, vast place. Um and, <laughs> and it was, you had to get into like there's an admin office. And that's where all the health and safety is, and that's where all the, um, the like the like the security and, and and the maintenance guys and everyone goes. Right, so it's it's the office that manages the building, the site. And we spent a couple of weeks sort of doing surveillance, looking at it, in and out of it, at different times of day and night, weekends, <laughs> weekends, evenings, everything. Did OSINs, plans out. You know, this is the guy who runs it. This is the woman who's in charge of the staff. Maybe we can try pretext A, B, C, D, E. And we had every, and that's, I'd always do that, right? And this is the shop and we've got good visibility there and we've got visibility there. So I put like, you know, my team, there's a guy waiting with um, a car in the car park in case we have to run. I had somebody watching for me. as another person. We had this big, complicated pretext all about, uh, it was about a temporary cleaning contract, sort of. I mean, we'll see which more. Sort of a temporary cleaning contract thing and uniform and everything ready in the bag. And I remember we decided to do that on a Tuesday morning at about half eight. So it's just waking up, you know, but people were kind of just settling in and literally just walked up. It was wide open, just walked in, did the thing I needed to do, took a photograph of what I needed to take and took out, took about 25 seconds. <laughs> Nothing that we'd done was required. It would have, it would have took no OSINT, no intelligence, no reconnaissance, no surveillance, nothing, no uniforms, anything. I literally could have walked in there in a pair of pyjamas, done the job and walked out. There was just nothing. And you just think, okay. (laughs) And although like people say, oh, you're pleased. Well, yeah, but I mean. Yes, I put all this work into it and I didn't have to use all my work. (laughs) We were ready if anything went wrong. Did anything go wrong? No, nothing. There was nobody there. <laughs> Literally nobody there. An open door, an open office, everything was there. There was nothing to do. And you do get quite a few standard, just standard. You, you, if you, again, ask any physical pen tester. This, <laughs> you're always surprised if nothing, if it just goes to plan because it, it generally there's something that doesn't. But you can be, and, and I always think that's the worst thing to happen to a newbie. You know, so if you take someone on their very first pen test and it's just nothing ever happens, <laughs> the confidence it gives them is so misplaced. Because you know, the next time there's going to be tasers and dogs and alarms <laughs> and police and, you know, fires. <laughs> just, you remember, I've said to people, it doesn't always go that smoothly. In fact, almost never. Yeah, That's... Uh... I had to ask the question that no one ever asked you. What's the <laughs> what's the most boring, uneventful thing that's ever happened? <laughs> it was very uneventful that Tuesday. It was great. <laughs> oh, that is awesome. Uh, Jenny, thank you so much for coming on the Easy Prey podcast. I don't know that we told anybody what they need to do to keep themselves safe. <laughs> yeah. Uh, no, we didn't. But, uh, but you know, 
what you need to do is always be, I can tell you it in just four things. Look out for four things. If someone rushes you, if someone asks you about money, if someone asks you to do something that's outside what you'd normally do, uh, and if they throw in agency. So do this quickly. If you feel emotional, if they mention money and a call to action of some kind, click on something, open something, send something. They're red flags, right? They're my four red flags. Any of those happen, and certainly if it's more than one of them happen, stop. <laughs> Don't do it. Other than that, in terms of security, basic cyber hygiene, all the things that I'm sure other guests have said, you know, don't reuse passwords, update all your apps. You know, don't have a Zoom call with like your bank statements and your passport <laughs> pinned to the notice board behind you. Sounds obvious, but it happened a lot in lockdown, that first lockdown, you I, I, it's I, the basics that let people through. I, 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 for, I forget where I saw it. It was um, it was a, a still frame of a video uh, of a journalist who was working from home during during the lockdown, and they had their camera, at, you know, showing them working at their desk, and mm-hmm. on their monitor they had the post its with passwords, usernames and passwords, and like yeah. this was like a live broadcast of their usernames and passwords. <laughs> Just think, like, yeah, for the love of cyber, take it down. Don't say, don't use password or I love you or one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Just, just, I mean, but that one, two, isn't three, that four, hard. five, six, seven, eight is okay. Uh, yeah. <laughs> or nine. <laughs> so it, yeah, if people want to find you online, how can they find you? Facebook, Instagram, yeah. Twitter, a website, LinkedIn? Like, so ironically, I'm quite easy to find online, obviously. So uh, my handle tends to be the people hacker. So you'll find the people hacker um, and you'll find that on, like, uh, you know, on Twitter, I'm Jenny underscore Radcliffe. And, you know, you, I'm easy to find on there. LinkedIn as well. The website and the business is humefactorsecurity.co.uk. Uh, but mostly people find me um, online. Instagram is real people hacker, but like really Twitter's the one where, you know, people can DM me and ask me questions. And the other thing, Chris, is like, I, I always, I have my own podcast, Human Factor Security Podcast. And because that podcast has been going a long time and people have, have been very generous coming on and being guests, I, I almost always say yes to an interview. So if people want to hear me talk, if they just put into like anything, YouTube, LinkedIn, anything, Jenny Radcliffe, you will find enough to bore you to death of me talking about my job and what I do. But the reason I do that is because people talk to me um, about it and, it and it matters that the word gets out there about this stuff because it's too easy sometimes yeah. and the bad guys do it and it's devastating when it happens for real which is why i will always even if i annoy everyone i will never shut up warning people about social engineering and um, so that's that's partly why as well yep i think that's a that's a great philosophy to have again thank you for coming on the podcast it's been amazing thanks for having me Thank you for listening to this episode of the Easy Prey Podcast. If you found this episode interesting and want to help with our mission, please leave a review at easyprey.com slash review. Notes and a transcript of this episode with Jenny Radcliffe can be found at easyprey.com slash 66.